And so we would order various copies of the same data and compare those prints that we would make against each other to see which ones had been jiggled with and which ones were, in essence, uh, raw data. Well, what's interesting is that the earlier missions seem to have less tampering than the later missions, as you're going to see. Now, this is a photograph taken by the Apollo 10 crew, which went up in 1969, in May of 69, uh, which had Gene Cernan, again, as a uh, um, lunar module pilot. It had Tom Stafford, and I forget who the third astronaut was. Uh, it'll come to me in a minute. John Young, John Young, um, who I think still technically is, is with NASA. I think he's the last surviving guy from one of the original astronaut uh, uh, recruitment programs back in the, in the 60s. Anyway, the, the mission of Apollo 10 was to test out procedures for the lunar landing on Apollo 11. So at one point, what they did is they separated the command and service module from the lunar module, and Cernan and Stafford in the lunar module went down to 10 miles, 50,000 feet above the moon, sweeping over a region on the front side called Sinus Medi, which means Middle Bay. And they took lots and lots of pictures in black and white, not in color. Oh, I wish these were in color. One of the pictures was this one. Look what happens when you enhance this version of this scene. Can all of you see what is hanging in the sky above Sinus Medi? This absolutely astonishing grid work. This amazing three, I mean, this looks like the top of a circus tent, which has tetrahedral legs some kind of complex geometric structure, and there's all kinds of 3D. And again, this stuff at all these angles is not scratches. Scratches are produced by rollers when film is transported through a developing system. They're all parallel to the edges of the frame. You can't get all different crisscross scratch scratches, particularly when the negatives are carefully preserved in glassing envelopes, and they only take them out to make a static enlargement on a photographic enlarger. There's no mechanical jiggling. It's all done with white gloves in an air-conditioned room, et cetera, et cetera. So, and I think I've got a color version. Okay, this is an enlargement showing details of the geometric structure, angle bracing. You can see grids. You can see it's a 3D geometric uh, constructional grid. That's the only way to describe it. This is now a color version. We colorize it because you can actually see some of the geometry better in color. This is all hanging over the central part of the moon. When you look at the moon on a full moon night, right dead center in the center of the full moon is this region. And of course, you're looking at all this stuff from the top down. You're not looking at it sideways like you're in lunar orbit, which is how these scenes were taken. This is another photo. This is 4810 from the Apollo 10 sequence. And when we do the same thing with this, this is now 4816, um, which was a subsequent photograph taken several frames later. This is uh, the crater Trisnecker. There are a whole bunch of rills here. This is a crater called Ukert. This is looking north, more or less. This is east. West is over here. Notice the limb. And then if I go for a close-up, like this is 16 in close-up, but it's cutting off all the bottom part of the frame, what I'm going to show you is from the horizon up to the top of the frame. When I enhance it, bingo. How high is it? How high is this stuff? That's an exquisite question. Some of these structures we think go up as high as 20 miles. Now, you say to yourself, that's impossible. You can't build something 20 miles high. Wrong, pale face. You're dealing with the moon. The moon has one-sixth gravity. So, if you can build something out of concrete and steel, which Frank Lloyd Wright wanted to build back in the 1930s in Chicago, he wanted to build a mile-high tower out of concrete and steel on Earth with winds and hurricanes and storms and snow and rain and all of that. If you were to build Frank Lloyd Wright's mile-high skyscraper on the moon, one for one scaling out of the same materials, you could build it six miles high because the gravity is one sixth, right? Now, suppose you had access to a material that was much stronger, 10, 20, 30 times stronger than steel, right? 
then I could build something that's 10, 20, or 30 times taller than six miles. 10 times would be 60 miles? 20? No. Do you know what on the moon is 10 times stronger than steel? Glass. Glass in a vacuum is stronger than steel. That's why these structures were made of glass. You make structures in a vacuum without water in the crystals, and you use robots to do it. Lots and lots and lots of little nano robots, okay? We're almost there now, manufacturing techniques with computers and assemblers and all that stuff. Think of a civilization that's this amazing, and they're only slightly ahead of where we are almost now. A 20 mile tall thing, which I'm gonna show you a picture of, is nothing. This stuff is typically on the order of maybe 10 miles, five miles, something like that. And there are parts of it, like here, that are clearly sticking up. I mean, this, this is an incredibly complex set of geometries, which depends on the sun angle for us to see it. Because now, of course, it's been bashed and battered and beaten to smithereens by untold millions of years of micrometeorite abrasion. An incessant sleet storm of hypervelocity particles moving at tens of miles per second. When a particle hits something solid moving at those speeds, it doesn't just abrade it like, you know, a Sahara sandstorm. It explodes when it hits. And it vaporizes a little portion and blasts it off as atoms, superheated atoms, into the vacuum of outer space. And so this stuff has been beaten and beaten and beaten. And so what we're seeing now, I have calculated, has the consistency of cigarette smoke. It is almost gone. The only reason we can see it is we're looking through mile upon mile upon mile upon mile upon mile of this stuff, and that's why it's optically scattering enough light to be visible to this relatively insensitive film. Someone mentioned earlier tonight that the two missions that are currently orbiting the moon, the Japanese mission and the Chinese mission, loaded with state-of-the-art CCD cameras, should absolutely have no problem in seeing this stuff and should be making stunning announcements to the entire world. Well, that's only true if they're not part of the same game. And since I think what their missions are are basically military reconnaissance missions to find out where the good stuff is so they can plan their manned landings and go and snag the technology and the stunning things that are waiting to be retrieved from the lunar surface and beneath the lunar surface where meteorite abrasion has not ruined and destroyed what we are seeing. They're not going to make any announcements or tell the world anything about why they're there. The only ones that are going to know are Putin and Bush and the other high-level guys that know they've been covering this stuff for more than 40 years. That's why, by the way, the Russians have blew the whistle on the Americans. That's why they never said, oh, those guys went and they photographed ruins. Why? Because they want to, when they go, they want to keep the same secrets. They want access with no one looking over their shoulders to what's really there up until what happened in Washington a few days ago, which raises the intriguing and important question, which I don't have an answer for tonight. What is Putin's real game? Why are the Russians suddenly making this data through us known around the world? Why are they making such a big deal of it? That's a really important question, and I wish I had the answer tonight. And I don't, and I'm going to find out as we go through this exercise, all of us together, as our book climbs up the New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> See, I've got it in what, maybe a dozen times now? I mean, politically, that is gold. That allows us to force these issues. That obviously is news in certain quarters. It is people voting with their dollars to read this real information. You've now had a chance to look at the book do you think you're going to have fun going through this, page by page by page?